Welcome everyone to the Sound Girls Living History project. I am Hasmin Jolito and I have the absolute pleasure of being here with a very, very important and special person for me, Susan Chani. How are you, Susan? I'm so happy to be here speaking with you and I very much admire and applaud the work that you're doing to present the histories of women in this industry. Thank you. Could I call you Jasmine or Hasmine? Which is better? Mm, well, Hasmine. I think that you you should decide what Hasmine is the proper okay. pronunciation. I can yes. I can say that Hasmine Hasmine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds perfect. Good. Thank you. So, Susan. Um, for those out there who might not know you, how would you describe yourself and what you do? I am an acknowledged pioneer in electronic music, and I have worked as a recording artist. I have maybe 20 albums released. Uh, that cover a wide range of expression from pure electronic all the way to orchestra and piano. Mm -hmm. I'm a classically trained musician with a master's degree in music composition. I worked for about 20 years in New York City with a music production company that became the number one go-to music house for high-tech music. It was called Chani Musica, and I worked for all the Fortune 500 companies designing sound, sound logos, and commercials for Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, General Electric, Atari. Also, I am known for having uh, designed the sound for a groundbreaking pinball machine called yes. Xenon. So that was one of the first, uh, that was the first uh, pinball game that used a female voice. And uh, so I've always had my hand in the edge, the front edge of using technology. Now my career, I'm much older now, but I continue to work because I love it. And my career involves running around the world when I can uh, <laughs> and uh, performing solo concerts with a Buchla, B-U-C-H-L-A, Buchla Electronic Music System. This is something that I played in the 70s and I'm out playing it again. It's an analog modular music system. Wow, so many amazing and inspiring and I'd say groundbreaking things. Uh, it's really fascinating. And one thing that um, impresses me a lot and inspires me a lot is that you've had such a prolific and diverse career. And I was wondering, do you have some sort of advice for people who as well pursue a multi-layered professional profile? In my day, the way to get into the industry was through the ground floor. Mm -hmm. You know, you take on a job that, you know, maybe you were an assistant in a recording studio. Mm -hmm. But if you have an opportunity to get on the inside of any, you know, area in the industry, that's a good starting play place. And the idea is to keep your eyes and ears open and absorb everything you can all the time, like a sponge. So you learn kind of in the, in the situation. You can also, you know, when I was young, there were no schools to study any of this. There were no schools for electronic music or for doing anything. Uh, I know it's different today that you can get 
a degree and and that's all wonderful I don't know what it's like actually because my my degree was in traditional music and that certainly did help me when I went to work in the industry but I was doing something very different I was doing electronic music and what is that well that's a different discussion um but uh, I think it's to, you know, find your entry point, keep your eyes and ears open, learn everything you can from the inside. Also, you know, study, but realize that any, any work that you do is with human contact. You know, I, I think that your relationship with the people you're working with, that professional relationship is something you need to cultivate as well. Be confident because that's why people want to work with you because you, you have something to say and you you have to believe in yourself, you know, before anybody else is going to believe in you. <laughs> but, um, but it's always good to get reinforcement, you know, from outside. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, be, feel your core sense of worth and your, you know, your ambition that you want to do something. Wow, that definitely is a very important yes. Um, uh, how was that for you? Did you have um, any particular moment that was when you first felt that confidence that then propelled you to your career and to New York? Or how was that? Um, you know, I, I don't know how to express this exactly. I, you know, I was always in love with music. Mm-hmm. So when I was little, I would play the piano for hours and hours a day. And one day when I was in grade school, I was standing out in the playground Mm -hmm. and out of nowhere I got this kind of message, this sense that something, I I can't even explain it, but I knew at that moment, just like a spark out of no place, that I had something to say Mm -hmm. and that it was in music, but I didn't know how it was going to come out. I didn't know what I had to say. I knew I had something to say. And so, you know, the beauty of this uh, field is that there is no one path. There are so many approaches. And mine was a very, you know, it was a unique path. Mm -hmm. Who could have guessed? There was nobody that said, oh, you're going to be an electronic music pioneer. I was like... What's that? I mean, (laughs) in fact, you know, all the first years that I was working, nobody understood what I was doing. It was very lonely Mm -hmm. because I wanted people to understand, but they didn't. My audience said, well, where is the sound coming from? What is that? But I was motivated by, in some senses, hunger. Mm -hmm. Uh technology you know it was a it was a circle I was in love with technology technology was expensive very Mm -hmm. expensive back then it's not like today yes magnitudes of difference to have you know instead of you know it was like buying a car or a house you know Mm -hmm. and in order to get the money to feed my desire, I had to work. Yes. And so it was a circle. I used those, you know, I, I earned some money. I uh, bought more equipment. The equipment helped me to earn more money. And eventually I, you know, I, I went to Los Angeles and worked for a while in the film industry. And I was kind of interesting because, uh, Nobody had ever seen a bukla. Mm -hmm. But I didn't like L.A., uh, even though it had a good film industry, because it didn't have a good art scene. Okay. 
So I think even in our ambitions, you know, we need to make money. And I always say I worked as an artist while making money. But then I also had a side to me, which was pure art, mm -hmm. where I played with dancers and played in museums and cultivated, you know, a free, a freedom in my expression. And that led me to New York. So I went to New York because the art scene was better. Okay. But it, so was the commercial scene. And I ended up, you know, making a huge, uh, you know, uh, footprint mm -hmm. in the commercial music business. Yes, there's <clears throat> something that I've read you, you mentioned in some previous interview about how uh yes the sound of of your music well your sound was very new and almost alien for most people but um people working on advertising sort of always wants to be there like at the very edge of everything uh, exactly. yes so they, they they were looking for something new whereas mm -hmm. the record companies were not looking for anything new. They wanted the same hit that they'd already mm -hmm. had. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that was a discovery. You know, who who would have I didn't even know there was advertising music. It wasn't <laughs> in my consciousness. It's just that when you meet up against a wall, mm -hmm. my wall was hunger. Yes. I one day I woke up and I said where is the money? <laughs> Where? I need, I need money to live. And somebody said, well, you know, you, there's a book. I didn't even know this. There was a big book called the, the Red Book. Mm -hmm. And it had a list. It was like a phone book of all the advertising agencies. Uh -huh. And I got hold of this book. And I said to myself, well, I'm going to start at the top. Why should I start at the bottom? <laughs> I, I'm going to pick the 20 top music agencies, advertising agencies. Mm -hmm. And I made a list of the top 20. J. Walter Thompson, uh, McCann Erickson, Young and Rubicam, you know, these big, big advertising companies. And I started knocking on the doors. I did not know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the structure of the companies. Who do I call? Do I call the president? Do I call? Some of them had music directors. Mm -hmm. And so I could call the music director. And I made a calendar. And the calendar had the 20 agencies. And every mm -hmm. time I called one, I'd make a note in the calendar. And they always said, call in two weeks. Okay. And so I would call. <laughs> two weeks later, I would call. I say, hello, this is Suzanne Chani, and uh, I'm a composer, and I have a wonderful electronic music uh, instrument, and I'd like to show you what I can do. And they'd say, well, nobody's here right now. Call call in two weeks. Oh, and no. this one, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> This, this went on and on and on. And finally, at the biggest agency, I think J. Walter Thompson was the biggest, and this was McCann Erickson. And uh, I got an appointment. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is amazing. So, you know, on the day of my appointment, I get all dressed up. I think I had one pair of pants to my name. <laughs> I, I didn't even have, you know, a, clothes. And I went up to the agency and I said, um, I'm here for my appointment. And the woman said, oh, I'm sorry. He's not here today. No. And I said, oh. And I, I rescheduled the appointment. Mm -hmm. And then I came back again and she said, I'm sorry. He's not here. And I said, oh, now I'm you know, I'm a little worried. The third time this happened, 
Oh. I said, where is he? <laughs> he has an appointment with me. <laughs> he has an appointment with me. You know this story. Do you know this story? <laughs> I, I do, but but yeah, please, yeah. Please so so going. anyway, I said, "Where is he?" She said, "Well, he's at this recording studio." And I said, "Well, where is mm -hmm. that?" And she told me, you know, it was in Times Square. And I went, and uh, I I walked into the studio, and the person there said, "Well," I said, "Where is Billy Davis?" And he said, "Well, he's in session, and you can't go in." Mm -hmm. And I said, "He had an appointment with me." And I went over to the door and I opened it and I walked in. Mm -hmm. And there I was in the, I was in the uh, the control room, you know, and they were working and he was just completely shocked that somebody had come into this room during a session. And that was, you know, how I got my big break. So I would say there there have been times in my life when I didn't push through, when I did not go all the way, when mm -hmm. I got really close and then I gave up. And in retrospect, I saw, you know, that if I had just gone forward one more step, I would have gotten in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when to go forward, when to stop, uh, when your little voice tells you to give up, mm -hmm. don't listen to it. Good. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a simple thing because you will you will regret it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we have all this energy, but sometimes our energy only lets us go so far. And what we need is that tiny little bit more. I have so. You know, I have so many stories like this. Stories of uh, well, determination. Termin and... like, you know, when I went to work for Don Buchla. Mm -hmm. Tell us, please. So Don Buchla is, uh, he is the designer of the electronic music instrument that I'm using today. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1969, uh, 70. I went to, 1970, I went to work for him when I finished graduate school. Mm -hmm. I had fallen in love with this concept of electronic music, and I knew his instrument because I, there was one at the Electronic Music Center at Mills College, so it was called the uh, San Francisco Tape Music Center, and it was the first public access uh, place in the country okay. for being able to get your hands on these new instruments. And the very first mm -hmm. bukla was there. So I knew I wanted to play the bukla and I went to work for him. Mm -hmm. And day one, at the end of the day, I was fired. Why were you fired? I was fired because what was my job? My job was to look at schematics mm -hmm. and then to choose the parts, you know, the resistors and the capacitors and the little electronic parts and stuff the circuit board. So you put mm -hmm. these things into the board according to a diagram yes. and then you soldered those parts in. So you turned the board over, you took a soldering iron and some solder and you held the solder and heated it until the connection was made, until the solder melted. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of the day, they would test the boards and they found what's called a cold soldering joint, which meant that the solder melted, but it wasn't hot enough. Okay. And so the connection wasn't made. And Dawn said, it must be the new girl she's fired. Oh, no. Yeah. And I said, Wait a minute. How do you know that it was that it was me? That's not fair. It could have been anybody that did that cold soldering joint. And of course, it probably was me. But <laughs> anyway, 
but he was giving you only 24 hours to learn how to solder, right? Right. <laughs> That's a very exigent boss. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So anyway, so I just came back the next day. I said, I said, you can't fire me. Mm -hmm. And I came back the next day and I stayed. So sometimes, you know, if we let our, our vision, you know, be uninterrupted. So if you really, if you really, really want something, mm -hmm. you go for it. If you really don't care, then, you, you know, it's not going to work, right? So you have to find what it is you really care about. Because caring and wanting that is going to give you the, the focus and the commitment to go forward and make, you have to carve your own path. And that's fun, you know, because every individual is unique. You can be inspired by other people because of, you know, the, the accomplishment. But your own path is your own. You make it. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And um, while working with Dom Bukla, <clears throat> the pieces that you were putting together, uh, were those going to be part of new Buklas? Yes. So in those days, the Bukla, he had just designed the Bukla 200. Mm -hmm. The one I had seen at the Tape Music Center was the Bukla 100. The Bukla 200, to this day, I think, is the pinnacle of Don Bukla's design. Mm -hmm. And that's a long story to discuss. But uh, so the, the Bukla 200, in those days, individuals didn't really, mm -hmm. didn't own them. We were making systems for Cal Arts, California Institute of the Arts. We made one for uh, a studio in Norway and you know either very very wealthy people like the king of Siam or something you know we're buying these or they were for schools and institutions okay so if you were working on these uh, systems that were then the the 200 like the one you had it means that you were sort of part of the construction process of your instrument, meaning that you were sort of a luthier of your instrument, right? You know, as a matter of fact, uh, I did feel, you know, in my time with Bukla, I learned something important from him. Mm -hmm. That in this technology, I, th I think that the field of music technology is fundamentally collaborative you have mm -hmm. the engineer who's designing the you know mechanism the making it work and you have the artist who is using that mm -hmm. and that it translates as Don taught me between the inside of the module and the outside so I could design the outside of the module I would say, I want this knob here. I want this knob to do that. I want to be able to control this and that. And then Don could design the inside to make that work. So to this day, I'm a firm believer, you know, we had uh, an exploratory group then called Experiments in Art and Technology. EAT uh -huh. and it was started or fostered by uh, Oppenheimer who okay. you know had been instrumental in designing the atomic bomb mm -hmm. and to give back you know to make technology a more a forgiving thing and not just destructive 
uh, he started this group where he brought together engineers and artists. And to this day, that mingling and fertilization mm -hmm. of those two domains is, is hugely fertile, right? It's, it's how things go. If you develop things just purely technologically, without reference to the person on the other side, you know, mm -hmm. who's using it, you're going to get in trouble. Yes. And, you know, just in my own world now, um, I see that happening even today. I see it happening in my computer. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's another, that's a different conversation. But I think if you're going to be designing, uh, you, you need to collaborate. Whatever it is, if, even if it's a Tesla car, you know, somebody's going to be driving that car. Mm -hmm. Yes. My sister, my sister bought a Tesla. She's out driving and all of a sudden it starts to rain. Uh -huh. And she doesn't know how to turn on the windshield wipers. Oh, no. So she pulls over to the side of the road and they have a number you can call in an emergency. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, well, for heaven's sakes, why don't you just have something in the car that says, hey, Siri, how do I turn on the windshield wipers? <laughs> you know, <Yes>. something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hi, Siri. <laughs> She, she heard me. Oh. <laughs> I have Alexa wow. and Siri. Whoops. Oh. <laughs> you have all of them. <laughs> They're always listening too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I definitely uh, firmly believe in what you just said. That working collaboratively with people from different disciplines is always something that brings a lot of richness and that in turn ends in a much more enjoyable thing, whatever that is. And I've been wondering because, well, I'm, I'm a game developer, so this is especially interesting for me. Oh, um, excellent. How was this like when you were working on this revolutionary pinball machine? Uh, you were working with engineers, right? And with maybe even sort of game designers. Yes. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, when they invited me to do that, I was kind of, you know, I had become very well known in New York uh, and, and, you know, beyond. Uh, mm -hmm for my sound design. I had a lot of press and a lot of television interviews and, you know, media exposure. And so when Bally Pinball called me, I, I thought, well, okay, this is interesting. I don't really know anything about pinball other than that maybe I tried it a couple of times. But I, I never say no right? Because even if I don't know what I'm doing, it's like I love the possibility of doing something I don't know. You know, it's like, yes. So I remember I went to Chicago, their headquarters, and I met all the people who were in that point designing the machine. So they had blueprints. Mm hmm and they had the game design and they had all of this like structure of, uh, I forget what they even called it. You probably know, you know, uh, the rewards and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the levels of play. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What is that called? The. Well, I'm assuming that it's the progression of the game and the difficulty curve and the learning curve, all yes. of that entangled together. Yes. And they wanted the sound, of course, to reflect all of the, you know, that that uh, structure. And uh, so the art, you know, I was a little bit 
shy in the art department because I couldn't really appreciate <laughs> you know, the art. I just thought, is this art? To me, up to that time, art, you know, was something in a museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister was an artist. And I thought of that as I reserved the word art for that sacred, you know, category of mm -hmm. historic, you know, expression. Yes. Mm -hmm. So when I see art department, and I go in and I see, you know, a woman's rear end, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the <laughs> drawing. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, but he was a really, you know, they had an excellent, and I now I can't remember off the top of my head his name. Uh, but anyway, it was really fun. I... I learned, you know, the inside out of the game and uh, designed the sound so that it, for me, it was a composition that could be performed by the player. So it made musical sense. You know, this, the music actually evolved musically while the game was played. Yes. Oh, that that you are saying is actually something that uh, we talk a lot uh, when when we talk about game audio, because it's always sort of like that, because the player is ultimately sort of the orchestra director or the performer who is deciding which sounds will sound together and live together. And it's it's just so fascinating to me hearing you talk about that and knowing that you had that same uh, perception. Yes, I think technology is misleading in ways because um, there's some there are two departments. One is conceptual, the idea, and then the other thing is the practicality of how that idea is uh, allowed to manifest. Technology, we know, always changes. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing about being in technology. You wake up and, and then there's a new IC, or there's a new integrated circuit, or um, let's see, when Don Buchla was working, there was a new, uh, what was it? Um, there was a an early part that had just come into being in the 60s and that made all the difference. Okay, so that is not what it's about. That is the um, delivery system. Mm -hmm. But the ideas are uh, more universal and how you deliver them can change. But the ideas are valid as, you know, the concepts are valid and they, they go way back. Uh, mm -hmm. They're human. They're yes. they're more connected to. You know, we have we changed that much. We have I, hands. No, mm -hmm. I mean we're as an interface. We have hands. We have voices. We have eyes. We you know our bodies are pretty much the same mm -hmm. as they've been. So so yes, technology has has uh, evolved. So, you know, it's, uh, that's why right now I'm really happy because the kids, mm -hmm. probably you too, you know, stop this headlong march of technology forward saying, well, technology goes forward and it always gets better and just go forward. And the kids woke up one day and they said, wait a minute, my hand is sore. I, I don't want to just hold a mouse and look mm -hmm. at menus and be diverted from my idea by going into this, you know, endless menu. Mm -hmm. And they said, I want to touch things. Yes. I, I just want to interact live. And we were doing that in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So they went back. Yes. And that's when you came back to the book. Yes, right? that's when I came. There I was. <laughs> there I was. 
That's fantastic. And how did that feel? Um, I think that uh, this is something that lots of people are sort of scared about, of going back to something that they left 10 years ago. Uh, how was that like for you, going back to the instrument, reconnecting with also a new version of the instrument, because this was the 200E, right? Yes, don't you know all the details? Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, for me, it was a dream come true, because when I originally performed on the Bukla, mm -hmm. nobody, as I said, nobody understood and I was lonely and it was frustrating and I was always trying to teach people about what this was. Mm -hmm. And then to go back and go out and perform and have an audience that understood what I was doing was just a dream come true. I thought, how can I be so lucky as in my own lifetime to mm -hmm experience that connection that I was denied, you know, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Nobody got it in the 70s. And now everybody gets it. And the other thing is that because I've been uh, involved in this for so long, I am very aware that we never accomplished what we meant to accomplish the first time around. Mm -hmm. So going back is important because we missed, uh, you know, we, we were diverted. Technology, here's what happened. It was scary to the public. Mm -hmm. And to make it less scary, the, the manufacturers uh, simplified it. Mm-hmm. For musical instruments, instead of playing with patch chords and sliders and knobs and, you know, this non-keyboard world, which is the one that I play in, yes. they put a keyboard on it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the public could say, oh, oh I get it. I get it. it. It's a, you know, it's a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. But once they put the keyboard on it, nobody could see the real potential. The real potential was that it was a, you know, quadraphonic, spatial controlled, uh, voltage controlled, a whole new language. And so we missed that. We missed it. So now we're going back and we're, we're you know, I'm, I'm just now trying to release a quadraphonic LP. Oh, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we can do it this time mm -hmm. around. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yes, hopefully. <laughs> you know, uh, LPs. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that this thing that you just mentioned uh, is a very powerful metaphor of how sometimes uh applying an old and established structure that we are comfortable with doesn't let us see the full potential in some things. I think that this can be ex like it's extensive to all things in life. It's good to just be open and try to embrace things and have a fresh perspective always. There will always be people who uh, are the, you know, the starting points. And it's hard to understand something new. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's the problem. I, I mean, it's, I know people wanted to understand what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But really, I mean, even to this day, you know, with the Bukla, it still looks a little complicated, but there are more there are more people doing it now. Maybe they're not doing the Bukla, they're doing Eurorack. Mm -hmm. But, yes. uh, yeah, I you know, I think you have to have experience with something. Don't you? I don't know. 
you know, to, to understand it. I don't know. I mean, think I there are a lot of things I don't understand. Uh, you know, the other day I was trying to, you know, make my computer uh, recognize my CD drive. It would not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it just won't. Because <laughs> Apple doesn't want anybody out there to get in, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know that, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I agree that it's uh, approaching something that's new is always a little bit scary and it defies us. But at the same time, uh, I think that it's important to approach uh calmly and try not to let frustration get in the way yes and let's hope that the designers you know haven't gone off on a tangent someplace Mm -hmm. you know the designers some of them are working in uh isolation and that that can lead to problems Mm -hmm. you know so you you i mean i i'm impressed that you work in this field. I think that's wonderful. I wish, I wish you could help me with my Apple computer. <laughs> I, just, I, I had a, I had a guy on the phone, you know, yesterday, and he's getting me to write in the terminal, you know, and, uh-huh. and look at all this. And of course, I don't know how to do that myself. <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm aware that that's what's happening now. We have to take mm-hmm. it into our own hands because these machines don't care about us, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, how do you, now that we are talking about machines and our relationships with them, uh, how would you define your relationship with the Bukla? To me, it's it borders on magic. Mm-hmm. You know, when I look at this machine, uh, it just amazes me that when I'm performing with it, that I have such a warm relationship with it, that it, you know, I'm dancing with it. I give to it, it gives to me. And, you know, it's very alive. It, Mm -hmm. it's a, you know, this is like a being to me. But it's also just a hunk of cold metal and and stuff. You know, you have to bring the life to it. Mm-hmm. And that's the tricky part because, you know, sometimes I, I go to Berkeley College of Music and I'll, you know, teach this. Mm-hmm. And I see it through the eyes of the kids. Mm-hmm. And I go, oh, my, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, what is this? pile of you know stuff yeah the fact is that i played it i was in love with it you know from the Mm -hmm. moment i saw it and so i i played it for 10 years and i think that relationship developing a relationship and that takes time. Mm-hmm. And being calm, as you say. Uh, and and that's what, it, it's just time. You know, you just be, you be with it. You learn to mm-hmm. understand it and something will start to take shape. There's no one thing, you know, these instruments and the part of the beauty of technology is how unique every expression is with it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a potential, but every person is going to use it differently. Yes. There are so many possibilities. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, well, anyway, that's a long discussion. I won't, won't get but into it. But it's a beautiful discussion. Yes, please, please go ahead. Well, my feeling, you know, as we were talking about concept Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I think of music as a language Mm -hmm. 
And I think that if we look at the history of our music, mm-hmm. we will see, you know, categories of language that, you know, evolved. Yes. And this uh, category, it also what evolved were the instruments. Okay, so we, you know, we, we evolved a piano, we evolved a violin, we evolved a wind instrument, percussion mm-hmm. instruments, you know, these things grew organically. And as they grew, the people who used them developed techniques. Mm-hmm. And those techniques you know, help to redefine the the physical instrument. And this conversation went back and forth until, you know, we got what we got. Mm -hmm. So I think with electronic music, we we really also, we have evolved techniques. Mm -hmm. We haven't codified them yet, and we haven't abstracted them into objective, you know, ideas yes Mm -hmm. but they're there and I think this generation you know once we separate the techniques you know we're dealing in a very fluid world Mm -hmm. in technology yes there's no there there I I come up to the piano and it's the piano Mm -hmm. you know I know what I'm gonna get and I can (laughs) elaborate you know ways to use it and all of that but it is a piano when Mm -hmm. I come up to this instrument it's it's different every day I have you know I'm still making custom modules and modifying it because that's the way you work with this you say oh you know what I need this hey can you design me that Mm -hmm. so it's always it's malleable if yes. I need a special sequencer for controlling space, mm-hmm. I can get it built. I have yes. it right there. I have a special <laughs> sequencer that I want it. You know, does anybody else want it? I don't know. Um, but the techniques are what we're, uh, what I'm aware of have distilled. Mm-hmm. There is a language of voltage control in music that hasn't been codified. Mm-hmm. I have codified it to some degree, um, mm-hmm. but uh, it, uh, to me that's very exciting. And then the way, you know, those those techniques, as some of it seems so old, you know, I've been around so long. <laughs> I've seen it all, you know, I, I've seen it. <laughs> It's like somebody has gloves and they're controlling the sound in the air. And it's like, okay, I've seen that at least six times, you know, six Mm -hmm. iterations of that. And, uh, and does that have meaning? Yes, it does. It means that that is a technique. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's, maybe the, you know, the, uh, maybe it's Bluetooth. And there was no Bluetooth before, but the concept of dynamically shaping something by motion has been there uh, Mm -hmm. for a long time. So there's nothing new, even though we love to think of technology as new. Mm -hmm. There is nothing new. Isn't that sad? (laughs) (laughs) I mean... um... (laughs) <laughs> I guess that if if you put it so bluntly, it's a little bit disappointing. But at the you know same what? It time... was just a tease. It was yeah. just a tease. We know it's I... not true. We know it's yeah. not true. Yeah. But we. But but you know, our conversation started in you know looking in the past and like looking at this mm-hmm. as a keyboard. This this Bukla has been doing these touch plates for what? 50 years mm-hmm. and it's still new yes yeah mm-hmm. yeah I 
Uh, I think that mm, that I find super interesting about what you just said is that uh, with modular instruments, uh, even though, as you were mentioning, it's important to get familiar with your instrument and to let that relationship grow and understand its possibilities and the possibilities of your relationship with your instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, the instrument itself is also very flexible to your creative voice. I think that this is very unique. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, there's no there, there. It's not the piano. <laughs> yes. And therefore, how do you develop literature that can be, you know, performed across, you know, mm -hmm. from one person to another, you know, that has been how our music has been communicated. Mm -hmm. And we had notation, and then we had performers who learned how to read notation and respond to it. And we don't have that yet in electronic music. Is it important to have it? I, I guess know. that's, we'll yeah. see. We'll, we'll see. see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. You're the next generation. Uh, I think okay. that uh, something that is very new or that is new these days is the way how we share music with each other because maybe um yeah maybe we don't need to codify electronic music as much these days because we can share it more easily and register it more easily yes mm -hmm. okay yes we can you're right beethoven couldn't record Mm -hmm. All he could record was the notation, and then it could be reproduced. Now we can record. Yes. And uh, I, I'm right now involved in organizing my so-called archives. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, 50 years of recordings and things like that that I'm trying to organize. Mm -hmm. And you realize how fragile the ongoingness of this is. Mm -hmm. You put something into a digital format and 10 years from now, you might not be able to open it. That's very true, yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe we no longer have, you know, a stable reservoir of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know. I mean, we'll have, we we will have the printed page. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. You know, I had some pieces put into digital format, some mm -hmm. uh, scores. Yes. And those th that that software is gone. You you mm -hmm. can't open it. Yeah. You know, so so you had a symphonic piece that was in a particular uh, format, and it comes out gibberish now. I, I don't know. I'm aware that we're, for me, it's some kind of unknown. I have uh, stuff that's on paper. I have stuff that's in print. And I think, well, if I just scan this stuff, I can throw mm -hmm. it away. Mm -hmm. But that scan might not open <laughs> in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I live at the end of a, uh, I live on a cliff. And uh, at the end of a road, and nobody can find this house. And so the UPS guy apparently oh. left it, you know, at my neighbor's <laughs> a mile away. Okay, so here we are. <laughs> here we are. Okay. Um, 
Uh, we were talking about uh, different formats that we can sort of store our music in. And uh, one thing that I think is still sometimes a challenge is uh, when you have more than two channels, when you have something that's larger than a stereo field. Yes. Uh, you are very much interested in quadraphonic music. So how do you think about this challenge? We had uh, quadraphonic, you know, formats in the in the 70s. Mm -hmm. That was the first, you know, ch possibility of doing a say, for instance, a quadraphonic LP. Mm -hmm. And it failed. Uh, it failed, I think, because there was no content. People just didn't know how to use it. The potential was there, the format was there, but nobody, there was no spatial music. Mm -hmm. And I was standing there on the sideline saying, wait, wait, I can do spatial music. <laughs> Listen to me. <laughs> and, and they were saying, well, you know, they, they were busy doing concert hall music. Mm -hmm. So they said, well, I know we'll put two channels in the front and two channels in the rear, and that'll replicate the concert hall. And that was so pointless. No. Yeah, it's like so <laughs> stupid. So it failed. No content. Now, uh, do we have con content now? We have some types of content. Mm -hmm. What you're doing interests me because it's generated in the moment yes. the space is actually you know if you're playing a game you're you're creating the space at the time and that's what I do it's part of my music the way the sound moves is important the distance that it is the closeness that it is the whole imaginary space we do have sophisticated post-production spatial techniques that have evolved through the film industry. So the mm -hmm. film industry took the lead and they said home theater and people got 5-1 setups. And this is really very much based on film because you have the, you know, center channel for the voice and then you can have uh, effects uh, that move and your music. Um, now that people have that infrastructure and they have the setup, we can use that to pipe our our spatial music. Uh, Atmos, you know, the uh, Dolby system yes. mm -hmm. is po what I say post-production. So you're not, not generating the space as you do it. You are applying mm -hmm. the space afterwards. And that's a huge distinction. Definitely. Because there are certain things you can't apply. Mm -hmm. or at least not now. Uh, movement is rhythm. If you don't integrate the movement with the actual rhythm of the music, you're creating a mess. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? I mean, you could do it. You know, you'd have envelope detectors and you'd have things that detected the beat and then you could translate that into, you know, sources of motion. Uh, they haven't really done that yet. Um, but anyway, they do have a way to deliver spatial music. Mm -hmm. And I'm just now working on getting my quadra. You know, what I've done is I sell my quadraphonic recordings as raw files. You know, you go uh -huh. to a website, you download them, and then you can listen in quad. Okay. The quad LP that I did, what, two, three years ago, we included a decoder. Mm -hmm. So the whole package cost 200 over $200 so that you could buy the record and also decode it into quad. Now, thanks to the more uh, emergence of interest in spatial sound, I can rely on... Uh, resident decoders. Mm -hmm. So I can deliver a quad LP and you have the decoder. I don't have to 
send it with you. So that's what I'm doing in my next project and we'll see what happens. It's also stereo compatible. So if you don't have quad, you it will still play in stereo. Okay. It's good. It's very good to have the option of doing that. Uh, but I definitely hope that in the future, quadraphonic systems become more, just more accessible and that people start to enjoy that at home as well. Yes. It's just, it's so fascinating being surrounded by sound. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> yes. I have my four speakers here and I, you know, just live inside them like a little womb, you know? It's yes. Like, yeah. And um, I've been wondering, do you also feel the interaction between what you are performing and the place where you are performing in terms of these, of thinking about the sound in the living space? Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I have been surprised at how forgiving different spaces are. My first, you know, when I first played in quadraphonic, I wanted a very well-defined uh, sonic space. And then I was asked to perform in all kinds of spaces, you know, cathedrals, long and, th and, and narrow, and all kinds of spaces. And I was surprised how well it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not that uh, fragile. The sound, and, and also, uh, you know, it's very easy to translate quadraphonic up into more speakers. So people say, oh, you know, I played with 48 speakers. Well, guess what? That's not that hard. I mean, you can dial up and dial down easily. This whole, uh, you know, kind of bragging about I have more speakers than you do is uh, pretty much meaningless. And, and there is software now that there's a wonderful group in San Francisco called Envelop and they have software and I perform there and I give a quad signal and it comes out in 40 some speakers and it sounds great. Mm -hmm. The only important thing that at first people didn't understand is that, uh, you know, your, your environment has to be equal in a there were people that thought, oh, well, you know, we've got great speakers in the front and then the back is a little bit, you know, less. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, I guess that that's uh, sort of inherited from this idea that you have a front. And, right. well, you no. don't really have a front here, right? No, you really <laughs> don't. <laughs> And uh, have it's you ever, way. yeah, oh, I was just saying it's a different way of thinking. So start mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there any particular venue where you've performed that, I don't know, you remember, especially because it was interacting very mm, nicely with your music or because it was just very different? Well, I would say the thing that pops to mind is Royal Albert Hall mm -hmm. in London. Huge space, but it is, I, I guess it's, is it circular or elliptical? It's, uh, you know, it is perfect for immersive music. Mm -hmm. And they did such a fabulous job. I just absolutely adore adored playing there. You know, the sound at, I don't know, there's just the right amount of, you know, reflection in the space, but still distinction so that you mm -hmm. can feel the sound moving. It's not completely swallowed up and it works. One reason it works and I've, you know, worked on this, 
There is a thing, as we all know, called masking, which is if you're sitting next to a speaker, you're going to hear that speaker yes. and not another speaker. Mm-hmm. And that was a problem the first time around because the sound was not designed for the the immersive space. But when I'm performing, I have techniques so that the sound is not in one speaker all the time. It doesn't get ma- it doesn't mask the other speakers. It's actually moving. And so you can sit near this speaker and still hear the movement of the sound. And then there are, uh, you know, different types of motion. There's discrete, Mm -hmm. which is very useful uh, because the sound is only in one speaker at a time. Mm -hmm. And so as it moves, you know, you're very aware if it's not in your close speaker, you hear it, you know, Mm -hmm. distinctly in the other speakers. There is continuous motion where again, you know, it's always moving. So there's no masking, right? It's it's here and then it's moving over there. Uh, there are ways of controlling the, the size of the mm-hmm. illusion with yes. reverberation. Mm-hmm. And in the early days, we had voltage controlled reverb. Bukla designed this spring reverb Mm -hmm. that was voltage controllable so you could move a sound boom in out in out mm, slowly or whatever all kinds of motion yeah he was so i call him the leonardo da vinci Uh of you know electronic instrument design really i think it's fascinating to see how uh vision visionary ideas can be concentrated in one place you know that you really do have a a a well a source of ideas that comes out of a very specific individual Mm -hmm. yes Mm. it it sounds like it must have been very very inspiring to work alongside with with him and to be a part of that project right because i'm certain that what you what you did what you've done and what you are still doing is what sort of gives it its sense and its life right Mm -hmm. that was the source that was the source of it Mm -hmm. yeah and, you know, there were years that I, I wasn't playing the bukla. Mm-hmm. And uh, his designs, you know, continued. But they went more into the digital domain because that's mm-hmm. where technology went. Mm-hmm. And so he went with technology. But, uh, you know, that was a false promise in a way. You know, we all moved with technology the concept that it's getting better Uh, and i think to this day you know his most uh important designs were the analog Mm -hmm. the the analog machines it's it's a strange phenomenon that uh digital was its own distraction you know, it was, a, it was, it gave you, here's the thing, when you're dealing with technology, there's what technology wants to do, mm-hmm. what it can do. Okay. And then there's what you want it to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with Bukla, he was very fluid. He, he, his analog machines were, as I say, brilliant, you know. Um, And then he went with the flow. 
And by the time I got the 200E and I checked it out, I was like, my God, you know, this filter is awful. You know, it's <laughs> digital. And it, it had a memory and it could do all these fancy things. But it was a complete and I said, Don, you know, this filter sounds awful. There's no control voltage input, you know, in mm -hmm. the negative direction. And he would say, don't be attached to any idea. Just do something else. Uh huh. And how did you receive that? How did you react to that? Well, I did it. I did something else. And my first, you know, that first quad LP was a recording of my first concert with the 200E. Mm -hmm. And if you compare it to what I did in the 70s, they're, they're just not even close to each other. Mm -hmm. Right? It was a whole new, a whole new sound, a whole new control. It, it was a whole new approach. And I learned to accept some of this new, new sound. So part of me is sad that I don't have what I had. But I can still uh, explore and, you know, I, I kind of go with the machine. You know, it's a relationship. So, you know, your first husband was, you know, really a prince and your second husband is a good man. You know, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a fair comparison, yes. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> um. Uh, there's something you said a few minutes ago uh, about how the bukla is very um, fluid and tactile and not getting in your creative way as opposed to the mouse and menus and the digital world. Uh, and that uh, made me wonder about your creative process how how is it yeah how do you start a new piece or a new idea well you know i have a long history of ways of creating um i've done many studio albums my first album seven waves was very much a studio album and it was all electronic it was actually, you know, a synthesis of my classical roots with my new electronic, you know, expression. What I'm doing now is live in the moment. And digital is definitely not live. Digital can maybe give us a memory. But as soon as you have to do more than one physical action to do something, you're out of real time. Mm -hmm. So my life now is in real time, what I what I do when I'm out performing. And it's not, you know, it's a special subcategory. I nothing is everything. You know, you decide, you know, what umbrella you're under. I'm under the umbrella now of live interactive performance. Mm -hmm. And so that has certain needs. If I'm designing a sound logo for a company or doing a film score, it's not about that. Mm -hmm. So nothing is everything. You know, there are many approaches to creativity, and it depends on what it is you're doing. The one I enjoy the most now is the live, interactive, in the moment performance on the Bukla. Um, so, you know, that that's what I'm doing now. I can't, you know, 
you can't you can't do everything. I since I've gone back to the bukla, mm -hmm. I have not touched the piano. <laughs> mm -hmm. I I can't do both. They're just separate worlds, completely separate worlds. And uh, I you know and, and do I know if I'll ever go back to the piano? When I played the piano, when I was young. When I started playing the bukla, I, I was afraid of the piano mm -hmm. because people would misunderstand the bukla if they thought it was a keyboard instrument. And so I consciously stopped, you know, being with the piano. And I said, oh, I'll never go back to the piano. And then I went back to the piano. <laughs> and yeah. then I said, I will never go back to the bukla. And then I went back to the bukla. <laughs> and now I'm saying, I will never go back to the piano. Mm -hmm. We'll see. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think I will, though, because... Uh, not in the same way. I, I had a, an injury playing tennis. Oh. Yeah. And I have a, a screw here in my wrist now. And mm -hmm. my hands are not, you know, as pianistic. Yeah. Yes. But they're fine for the bukla. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um... <clears throat> When you are thinking about music, uh, what, what inspires you? Is it the same sounds that you are producing? Or do you get inspiration as well from uh, disciplines other than music, other than, than sound? What used to inspire me was emotion. Okay. So I know historically that most of my life was spent, you know, in this Italian kind of sense of passion and romance. Mm -hmm. and, and my recorded music from most of my life is, is about that. Even my early electronic music, it was all about emotion and expressing something that was very personal now uh, I'm I'm less you know my bukla live music is not a uh, romantic. Mm -hmm. It's more about driving the driving the machine and playing with the machine and being in the moment and uh, I I do think that the arts are very intertwined. As I said, my uh, my mentor was a photographer, Ilsa Bing, and I'm I am a photography collector, so I have a collection of photography. And what I noticed is that a lot of it is represented by women photographers. I didn't have this as a as a mission. It's just that I was attracted actually to the work. Of, of women photographers. Maybe it had to do with that emotional connection. In in a different way, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, my sister is an artist. She has done the covers for most of my albums. And she embodies perfectly, you know, my idea of an artist. An artist is someone who is an artist and will always be an artist. And, you know, it's part of your, your lifeblood system. You know, mm -hmm. it's just... Uh, I know with Ilsa, Ilsa was interesting because she, she grew up in Germany and she was Jewish. And in the war, she managed 
very with great difficulty to escape Hitler. And she was a well-known photographer in Paris. And then after the war, she, you know, she found herself in New York City completely penniless and uh, reinvented herself. And I think the war was uh, also shifted her vision from one of romanticism in the classic sense, you know, romanticism, seeing the beauty in a puddle on the street, seeing the beauty of the raindrops on the, you know, on a chair, you know, that kind of romantic vision. Uh, she lost it because she lived through the war and lost so many people. And her post-war vision couldn't support her earlier youth, youthful vision. And she started doing, uh, she stopped photography at a certain point. She just stopped. And I thought, oh my God, how can you, how can you do that? You know, at 60 years old, she stopped. What I didn't understand was that she didn't stop being an artist. She simply stopped being a photographer. And it took me years. I lived in fear because I had so uh, patterned myself. You know, she was my mentor. And I saw myself through the, the, the filter of this great artist. And I was always afraid, like, oh, my God, will I stop being an artist when I'm 60? <laughs> it's funny how we identify, mm -hmm. you know, as women. We had so few models. Mm -hmm. Yes. And mm -hmm. modeling really is very human. You know, it's it's what we do. We see it and, and it's we're comfortable in it, mm -hmm. you know. So uh, I guess for me, my Ilsa Bing moment in my own life is that at least for now, I've, I've shifted creatively. I'm not doing romantic. Was it a war that shifted me? No. But it was a personal experience. You know, I had this kind of fairy tale idea of what love was. Uh-huh. And I got married to my prince. Mm -hmm. And seven years later, my prince turned into a, a, a toad. You know? Oh. Like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so I, I just gave up that whole, I don't know, it just drained all that out of me. You know, that whole romantic... You know, there are so many ways to be romantic. It's not just a human mm -hmm. relationship. Yes. It's a way of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we'll see. Maybe my romanticism will come back, mm -hmm. but not attached to a prince. You know, we'll mm -hmm. see. Sounds like it would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do young women still think about princes? Do they care about men at all? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I don't feel entitled to speak <laughs> from all of them. But um, I think that um, um, I think it's really very important to have women to look up to who've uh, pursued whatever they decided with passion they wanted to do uh -huh. and I think that uh, even though I, I mean it's great that we are uh, finding them and uh, thanks to the internet it's now very easy to 
even connect with them as we are connecting now and this is marvelous and uh i think that another very important part of having these uh role models and of uh of being women uh of, of seeing professional women in action is also uh, nice to just talk with them about more mundane things and realize that uh, we are very much alike. We are all people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I just said, you know, I had this light here. I turned it on. Maybe we don't need it. It's so <laughs> it's so dark today uh, outside. It's foggy. They're having a um, what they call a controlled burn. So it's all smoky outside. Uh, but yeah, I guess I guess we're all, but I, I think, you know, your generation has a new rapport mm -hmm. with, uh, I mean, even with women, you know, when I was growing up uh, and women, you know, when I was in New York and I was the first woman to do a, you know, hired to do a Hollywood feature, or that's what they told me anyway. Uh, and all the firsts, you know, we were very aware that we were, you know, going into new territory. Mm -hmm. And there was a period where women, women were not friendly towards each other. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that's changed. Yes. And this is a gift of your generation. And, uh, you know, because it was so competitive back then, you know, there were so few openings. There still are a few. Uh, but women now, at, I, I say they have a critical mass. Mm -hmm. And this is so important that we actually accomplish more by being together because yes. we have power. We have some power now. When I was hired to do a Hollywood film, I was hired by women. Okay. Yeah, there were women in positions of power. Men didn't want to hire women. Mm -hmm. And it's a club. And now we have our own club. And this is exciting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> so. Yes. Uh, it's it's really nice being able to share with each other. And yeah, I think that um, it, it just inspires more and more women to join because they feel that they will be accompanied by someone really wants to help genuinely and support yes 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 mm -hmm. i'm very excited i you know i wish i could last forever because i want to see what your generation <laughs> what your generation accomplishes it's mm -hmm. a, it's such a, a a beautiful time now for women yes <laughs> yeah. yeah no you're it's you know exciting. you're lucky because you know, what do you, you don't know, maybe, or maybe you do, you know, what it was like. Mm -hmm. There was a time, you know, when women were not even people, right? You say we're yeah. all people, we're all humans. But there was a time when, you know, women professionally were objects. You know, you'd walk in and, and they looked at, I, I mean, I don't even want to talk about it because it was so... Yeah demeaning mm -hmm. so ridiculous yes. you know but that's the way it was yeah i'm very glad it has changed and yeah. uh, how do you feel about that do you think that uh it will uh further develop into an even more integrated uh professional world uh, without the clubs or do you think that this is how it will stay for some time? Um, I think that uh, 
once women build up their own, you know, in their club. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, sorry. Okay, I, I get a fax once a year. <laughs> so <I'm> gonna... <laughs> That's what I mean. I, th I think that the uh, women need to establish their own power. They will, you mm -hmm. will, we were never going to be granted power by the men in power. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they hated women. It's that they were not comfortable with women. Mm -hmm. They had their own. Oops, here it comes. And so... Uh, Eventually, <laughs> eventually women will uh, be on an equal basis with men and they will integrate. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we need to, uh, I mean, it's already start. I You notice the dynamic is already shifting, mm -hmm. that men respect women now professionally. Yes. Mm hmm in a way that they didn't before. I was lucky because I was in a unique position. Nobody was doing what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I stepped into a world where I had my, you know, my space. Mm -hmm. If you wanted a high tech, you know, sound design, <laughs> yes. something, you, you you came to me, okay. I had that one cornered. Uh, Whereas if you, if I wanted to sell my talents as a film scoring composer, yes, that didn't, that wasn't going to happen mm -hmm. because they had a lot of men mm -hmm. who had been doing that, would be continuing to do it. If I wanted to sell my talents to uh, the symphony orchestra, Mm -hmm. to be a composer with a piece performed in the symphony, that wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. I did that myself. I made money. I hired a symphony. And I recorded, you know, my symphonic music. And mm -hmm. we, you know, we, with a purpose, you can manifest a lot of things independently but you still need to integrate into the cultural institutions that really embody our our art forms. You know, if I want to hear, I, I could record my orchestra, but if I want to hear it in a symphony orchestra or have it programmed, that's a different story. You know, I have to get in. How can I get in? Well, there are people now looking for women composers yes. uh, I I had a defining experience mm -hmm. which is very much in in alignment with the work you're doing when I played at Royal Albert Hall mm -hmm. it was part of an evening that was devoted to women composers mm -hmm. and one of them was Daphne Oram uh -huh. Do you know her? Yeah, but please tell us about her, just in case mm -hmm. people might not know. Okay, well, Daphne Oram was one of the people that um, in the 40s started what's called the Radiophonic Workshop mm -hmm. in London. And uh, Delia Derbyshire was part of that. And these were women that were uh, working in sound design. So they used tape. So they had a studio at the at the radio center, <laughs> and they uh, designed sound. And I had never heard of them. I didn't know about Delia Derbyshire until uh, somebody in England released uh, recordings of my 1975 Buchla concerts and called me the Delia Derbyshire of the Atari generation. And I said, <laughs> wow. who, who is Delia Derbyshire? <laughs> I, I never knew her because nobody had, you know, told yes. me about her. So 
before the concert at Royal Albert Hall, a TV you know crew was there, and they said, "Well, tell me, uh, tell me about Daphne Oram." And I said, "Oops!" I said, "I I, I don't know. I don't know anything about Daphne Oram." And I didn't. And then, the concert, they premiered a piece of hers that she wrote in the 40s. So it was mm -hmm. like 75 years later, she wow. got a symphonic performance of her composition and it was brilliant. Oh my God, I cried. I could not, uh, you know, for me it was an epiphany. Like, and then I got angry. Why didn't I know about mm -hmm. this woman. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there were women writing orchestral music with technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was processing. She had two orchestras side by side, and mm -hmm. one of them was being live processed uh -huh. to to enhance the you know the the music. Yeah. You know, it was like, wow. As a composer, if I had known about her growing up, it would have changed my life. Mm -hmm. So I love the work that you're doing because I think we really need to know what's already out there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> and and all of the other women organizations around the, the globe that are doing this not only for audio, but for disciplines in general, art in general. It's yay. Okay, yes. that's that's what I thought needed to happen next. I said, you know, because <laughs> you know, I had that experience, and I thought we need to dig through history. Those mm -hmm. people are there; they've been there. Yes. We just we just didn't know about them. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is very exciting and uh, I also want to see how it evolves and uh, which new female creatives just uh, start working and giving us photographs and music and films and uh, I know that this is inspiring to you and I'd like to know if there are other things that are inspiring you currently to make more music and to perform and record and just keep working. Well, you know, I don't have an agenda, mm -hmm. so I, I'm kind of in the moment mm -hmm. and I trust the I trust the moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, I'm very distracted by organizing my archives, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a lot of work. Oh my God, <laughs> I, I just I can't wait till it's done, you know. But I, I have to do it. So that's where I am now. I'm kind of going through this process of uh, handling my my storage. I don't. I I'm half-hearted about it because I. I don't know if anybody will ever look at this stuff again, right? It's like, but I, I somehow feel as, you know, I, I am myself, but I'm also aware of the me that is uh, a part of history. And I respect that role uh, it's a lot of work to uh, respect that you know mm -hmm. uh, part of me would just like to go play tennis and forget about it all <laughs> <You know>? no <laughs> <laughs> I, I was talking briefly with um, well I communicate with Wendy Carlos uh -huh. and She's in the process now of writing her autobiography. Mm -hmm. 
And again, we were just trading notes. She says, you know, it is so difficult. And I think that being responsible for one's legacy is something that you, you feel called. You feel called to do it because you want the story to be mm -hmm. the, real, the real story, you know. Yes. There's so much confusion out there. So, you know, you have to take responsibility for it. So, But I would never write an autobiography. I'm not that disciplined uh, <laughs> in terms of facts. You know, it's like, oh, and then October 9th, 1969, forget it. I mean, <laughs> but there was a film, right? Uh -huh. and, and the yeah. film, I, I don't know if that's the right container for a, you know, a factual, uh, but the, have you seen the film that they did? The, yes, a Life, Life in, in Waves. Waves. Yeah, yes. A Life in Waves. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was very disturbed uh, by it because I was more involved in my orchestral music. Uh -huh. And just getting back into the bukla. Mm -hmm. And they were more fascinated with the technology side of me yes. than my classical composer side. Mm -hmm. And... I, you know, I, I didn't get it, you know, that, I mean, now the, the fact is that it's all part of the same container, mm -hmm. but the fascination with technology has always been more immediate. Mm -hmm. And that's because, uh, you know, it's hard to have made a, to have gained visibility. I, I gained visibility in technology. Mm -hmm. I didn't gain visibility in orchestral music. Mm -hmm. There were no openings. Is there any bit of that part of your professional path that you wish the film had covered and they didn't and that we maybe can talk about now? Well, I always saw myself as a composer. Mm -hmm. In the tradition of the music that I loved, you know, the classical music, mm -hmm. Mozart. If you look at my uh, compositions, they are they're uh, definitely inspired by those by Bartok, by Stravinsky, by Mozart, mm -hmm. by Beethoven, by Handel. You know, I feel a direct connection to those voices. Mm -hmm. But I I you know, as a as a woman, honestly as a woman, you know, when I wanted to conduct I was told a woman had no place on the podium. It is really sad, mm -hmm. I think, that so much talent, not only is it denied, mm -hmm. but it's, it's aborted in a way that you can't grow the talent. So you have an ability, but you can't nurture it because it doesn't get out into the cauldron of life you know mm. to this day when i i love classical music you know i'll play the messiah all, all day <laughs> but i'm always a little bit upset that when i listen to a classical radio station i never ever ever hear music by women yes never 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 now they're there you know they've started to discover renaissance painters you know who were women mm -hmm. who were not brought forth okay and I think with this digging back mm -hmm. you know we could even find 
But here's the problem, though. Yes, there were women, but did they get the nurturing that is, you know, is part of uh, being, you know, if you're hired like Bach was to provide music to the church and the nobility, you have an opportunity that you Mm -hmm. don't get when you're not hired. Yes. So even if the talent was there, it didn't Mm -hmm. get developed. Yeah, <clears throat> that's why what we have nowadays is such a gift. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you were saying earlier that uh, you wish you had known more about the other women out there composing music and using technology to do that. Is there any other thing that you wish you had known when you were younger that you know nowadays and that you wish you could tell your younger self? Um, You know, I, I, it was a different time mm-hmm. back then. Uh, we saw everything in uh, a duality, you know, kind of male and female. Mm-hmm. The men had the power and the women were objects in the power mm-hmm. structure. And uh, I think that, that that simplified duality is no longer, you know, apt. And I think all that gender fluidity is all, you know, part of this process of unhinging uh, the power structure Mm -hmm. in some way. I'm, you know, it's not my generation. So uh, I'm very much a product of my generation. Mm -hmm. I am grateful for the the women, Ilsa Bing, for one, you know, for the women models that I did have, mm-hmm. and she was one. And the thing about Ilsa was that she always wanted to talk about my work. Mm-hmm. So as a young girl, I mean, I had so many distractions, you know, a lot of them were romantic. You know, it was... <laughs> It, it was very hard, you know, <laughs> because, you know, it was just a chaos, you know, personal relationships were a disaster, right? Mm-hmm. One after the other. And uh, very distracting. And I'd go up to Ilsa and visit her. She was 80 years old and she'd say, Suzanne, Suzanne, tell me about your work. <laughs> And I would have to shift, you know, from this emotional preoccupation to really focusing on my work. And I I thought, well, my work's not important. Yes, I love it, but it's not important. Uh, (laughs) You know, (laughs) because we didn't see ourselves Mm -hmm. as important. And it it just took a long time. Uh, You know, even Ilsa, you know, if I followed her career, she was brilliant, you know, and she she discovered solarization, you know, before Man Ray. I mean, I am aware of the historical slights. She was very well known and there are many books written about her, but in her own life, she saw things pass her by. She didn't get acknowledged for the mm-hmm. things that she actually did. Mm-hmm. She was the first, you know, artist to use the, she, she pioneered the use of the Leica. Uh-huh. Uh, she, she did 35 millimeter as an art, you know, uh, tool. And before then photography was done with these gargantuan negatives and st- everything still and rigid and, you know, Let's take a picture. Mm-hmm. 
and mm-hmm. she was you know released out into the world in a new fluid way and takes you know motion uh and she she was an artist she was a poet she was a brilliant woman but she didn't uh you know history focused more on on the men artists and that's just the way it was it's very hard to readjust that uh that view Mm-hmm. But we yes. we need to do that, and it's not because a poor Ilsa didn't get acknowledged. No, it's because brilliant Ilsa didn't get acknowledged, mm-hmm. who made contributions that, you know, Ilsa was such a philosopher, and she always taught me that we don't come out of no place. You know, we're not just bursting onto the scene disconnected we come from a root system and we need to know where we come from we're yes. not floating in space mm-hmm. we're rooted in in our human you know legacy and so we need to know what that connection is I have a picture. Here's mm-hmm. here's one of Elsa's pictures on my wall. Wow. So you have her with you always. I have her with me. Yeah. That's that's fantastic. That only shows how how significant it is to have that person or that group of people who inspire us and who are our mentors. To keep them with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, And uh, you were saying, when you were talking about Ilda earlier, you mentioned that at the age of 60, she stopped taking pictures and that you were uh sort of worried that it might happen to you as well <laughs> and thankfully it did not <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, but is there any any other thing that's right now intimidates you or makes you feel worried or i don't know about your uh, career you know my ambitions have changed there was an unfulfilled uh goal that I had, which was uh, film music. Mm -hmm. So I was very skilled as a composer who could work with picture. And I just couldn't get the jobs I got, you know, the incredible shrinking woman was one that I got. And uh, Mm -hmm. honestly, today, I no longer have that ambition. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little sad, because when I was ready, when I wanted it, Mm -hmm. uh, when I worked so hard for it, I couldn't get it. And now if somebody gave me a film, I think I'd just say, oh, no, gosh, you know, (laughs) (laughs) know? (laughs) Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm back really to, I guess, a cottage industry, you know, I work, I'm, I live here alone. And I have my, you know, my, my studio, my quadraphonic studio. But I, you know, I have been through periods in my life that were quite different. You know, in New York, I had a big studio with a lot of people working for me. I made a million dollars a year, you know, in this business. Uh, and I'm not willing you know, I like to keep life simple mm-hmm. now. Okay. I like to do what I can do. I do collaborate sometimes. Mm-hmm. For many years, I did not collaborate. You know, all my albums, I self-produced them. I wrote them. I did have uh, a collaborator for arranging, Mitch Farber, uh, who was very important in the albums. Um the early albums uh but now you know i i collaborate you know uh through the internet 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's nice. I'm starting to collaborate, and that's new for me. Working with other people is, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But right now, as I say, I'm doing my archives, so I'm not even thinking. You know, once I get this project under control, I'll go back to, you know, my music. Mm -hmm. Well, it's exciting. I can't wait to hear what, what you work on next. And to yeah. go through the archives. I will be one of the people <laughs> who go through that. So now you know that you will have at least the audience of one person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm doing yeah. it for you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So we have Thank you. to start closing this interview. But uh, I just, I would like to ask you one last question, which is if there's anything you'd like to mention uh, that we didn't get to talk about today. Well, I can't, uh, you know, and what pops to mind, maybe, uh, oh, kitty cats. <laughs> I don't know. Cats. My, my cat hasn't showed up for this interview at all. Um, I'm not really a cat person. They just come here, you know, because I live out in okay. the country and they, they show up at the door. And I have this one cat named Mouse who uh -huh. is feral, and I would feed it, and it would go, <sighs> Oh, you know, and it did this. I said, I'm feeding you. You shouldn't be attacking me. And uh, this cat continued to be mean. And then uh, my assistant, who was here, mm -hmm. tamed this cat uh -huh. just by hugging it. Okay. And she wouldn't let it go. Uh-huh. And after a year, mm -hmm. now, the, the, now the cat is the most affectionate cat <laughs> on earth. I mean, it touched wow. me, touched me, touched me. It's like a <laughs> total transformation. Unbelievable. I wish I had documented it because it's unbelievable. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, that's just one of the, I guess what I'm talking about in one sense is the idea of slow, mm -hmm. the idea of incremental, the idea that things can change so slowly mm -hmm. that along the way you don't even know that something's happening. And I'm a big fan of realizing you know, so much of our life is instantaneous. You know, this happens, this happens, this happens. And there's this arc, the slow arc of time that we can't even observe. Mm -hmm. A plant growing into a tree or whatever. You can't sit there and watch it happen. But it happens. Mm -hmm. And so this incremental evolution is what you're a part of now that maybe you can't see it all shifting mm -hmm. but you're going to wake up one day and the kitty cat is going to be in your arms <laughs> and that's wow. incremental <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. yes that's beautiful and and it's very fulfilling. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. things move slowly, but they move. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. So that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Hasmin. It's really been sweet to talk with you. You know, you I, I wish I were the one giving you the interview because there's so much I'd like to know about what's <laughs> Anytime you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's been it's been a delight talking to you and asking you questions and knowing more about about your your life and your future projects and and hearing your advice. It's really 
been very inspiring to me and I'm sure that it will be very inspiring for the people listening to this. Wonderful. Thank you for this opportunity of reaching the people that you uh, connect with. That's wonderful. Thank you.